I have two ancient artifacts uh, at home uh, with me that I go back to look at them once in a while. One of them is this obsidian arrowhead, and the other one is this terracotta hanua sculpture head. And they are both from Japan. But tonight, I'm not going to talk about their archaeological significances, nor how I got them. But my point here is that I get goosebumps when I look at them, because I hear some messages. And uh, the message is not only about their times and lifestyle, but also about the very spirit of craftsmanship. And look at the details, you know, how vivid it is. Uh, they are. I hear voices saying something Im important I explained to you. Anyway, you know, I've gone through some tough times in my life, as anyone has, but from time to time, particularly in my early mid-career period, I had to go down mentally and uh, sleep under the a blanket of misery for a while. Of course, I had help from my people and doctors to get out. But uh, these objects, um, uh, ancient artifacts have also helped me to bounce back because I had a voice saying, hey, Yoshi, what you did with your hands have some meaning. And it's quite possible. Uh, it's going to be variable to the future generation of people, just like the way we uh, made you excited. So huh, I have bounced back. And I kept going. So this show at the, at the Botanic Gardens would testify my 35-year effort and consistency in the practice of art. And so I hope, I sincerely hope you uh, enjoy it from that angle as well. In this show, three themes in bronze, and I'm going to explain them to you one by one. But before that, let me articulate my, my take on this material bronze. Because I have noticed from the beginning of my career that there's something attached to it. So without knowing that, I couldn't move forward. So let me talk about this a little bit. Bronze is a very unique medium. It's an alloy of copper and tin. It was discovered 5,500 uh, years ago by Sumerian who lived river mouth of Tigris and Eu Euphrates River. There was a, a big delta in between. All these goodies from you know, head water to the river mouth from the mountains. They, you know, all these like minerals and metal things came down to the river, uh, two rivers, and accumulated in the delta as a sediment. So they were lucky at finding all these different types of metal. It was a copper, of course, before bronze, and it was beautiful. You know, it's a pure metal and beautiful material, but there was a limitation to it. When they discover when a mixing of uh, copper and tin, they form this incredible alloy and which is the very first uh, man-made metal in, in the human uh, history. So they were delighted and they started to make all these weaponaries and agriculture tools and so on and so forth. And that advanced their, their culture to the next level. So, and that's, that's, a, that's the part of the story of Mesopotamian civilizations. If you know, when Iron Age came, they took over some of those uh, responsibilities that bronze was taking care of, and because it was, it was much better metal for utilitarian purposes, and so they they started make uh, weapons and agriculture, pro, uh, you know, uh, tools and so on and so forth with steel. So but, uh, bronze was left alone, but it wasn't forgotten because it, it still is very beautiful and much more long lasting than iron. So they started to concentrate on the ornament making, including sculpture and other things. That stays to this date, and it's going to continue to the future. So this method specifically designated to take care of you know, creating symbolism in each culture and a strong statement. Because of that, and um, because material is very expensive and labor costs very expensive, energy costs very expensive, people tend to choose this material for very special occasions. You know, you could tell that, you know, they don't fool with it. A special occasion means to commemorate uh, historical events, the, the most important people of the time and other sort of significant things of their time to share with the people and also hoping to relate the information and statement to the la later generations. 
So that was the case and still continuing it, as I said. For instance, this piece, I, I don't know if you know the artist, but the humongous bronze sculpture of 60 feet. And it's from quite recently that 2017, uh, Venice Biennial. I'm sure the artist was trying to impress people. Uh, it scared people more than impressing people. Anyway, the size matters, but the statement is important. So, you know, you want to make it visible. So quite often, many of the sculptures are huge. Bronze sculpture is huge. Naturally, people have to look up to it and uh, bow down and admire and so on and so forth in any culture. Okay. But the other side of the coin for the, all these very significant statues and memorabilia is that what when I had to go down because time changes, you know, people's perception and the value changes. So they don't need these things anymore. It's unbearable to hang on to it because the statement is so loud and and clear, and, but no longer relevant to the new value system and so on and so forth. So this kind of culture, uh, culture uh, phenomenon has been happening since ancient time. And, and that's something that attached to this medium bronze. And I've been very aware of it. And, and so the, uh, from Arion, so I had to think about this, another ingredient in this alloy besides tin and other, ing- other things, and how to overcome it. And it was not easy for me to just accept and just use it as a, one of the mediums. But it's got a deep, sometimes dark shadow of uh, social, cultural, and quite often political implications embedded. So I spent a few years uh, and many years to what to do with it. And that was a part of my challenge in bronze for a long time. Oh, this one, have you seen it? This is uh, from the United States of America. And very recently from the child via uh, Virginia. It's an image of General Lee's final ride, or I should say exit. And I don't know where he was going, but uh, people are saying goodbye to, goodbye to him. And so my answer, uh, one of the solutions to uh, this very strong medium bronze was to commemorate insignificance instead of significance. And that approach was something that became, you know, uh, something is right, P- particularly for this Nature poetry series, that's the fundamental concept behind, okay? I deal with ordinary, down to earth, sensible, small, tiny thing, and broken off fragments of nature. And this photo is from this exhibition, and it's got 1,728 pieces of broken fragments from nature as involved, a lot of pieces. I'm half jokingly calling it Wabi Sabi Parade. You know Wabi Sabi aesthetics, right? As an artist and Japanese artist, of course I do. I wasn't too aware of me having such aesthetic, but the more I age, the more I notice it. It's really uh, with me and under the, uh, my subconscious. Of course, I know the essential aspect of Wabi Sabi, which I might call Wabi Sabi pathos and poignancy. And those are something that not sitting on the front row of this a visual vehicle, but in the back, because the piece is more about the prayerfulness and, and joyfulness that I discover in each form. And so it's the parade instead of funeral procession. Nature Abstraction Series, it's much simpler to explain. And I brought two pieces to this show, uh, not these two pieces. However, these pieces are showing at uh, Botanic Gardens uh, some years ago. And again, Lisa, who is she? But <laughs> <laughs> beautifully cu- uh, curated. Uh, I enjoyed it very much, particularly when those plants started to grow, uh, teasing my bronze sculpture and on site. And so I, it was wonderful. Now, the, these looping, freestanding looping forms are something I started to make when I got to Colorado 15 years ago. I have come up with many varieties and, and variations. It's a lot of work. And since I do make these pieces by myself alone, some pieces took a long time, which is, it was a joy, of course. But for instance, the piece on the, uh, on the left, I would say it took me four years. And of course, I was working something else at once, you know, simultaneously. So it didn't mean that, you know, highly concentrated a four years period. It takes time in general to, to finish. And I always negotiate with the sculpture how to end. And we always come to the agreement. And... Mainly I use the nature forms and texture for this sculpture. But one piece I made in the middle was I picked the man-made elements, which is a thick rope 
and again uh, in the format of freestanding uh, looping form and I liked it but it was so technically difficult to make so I have a feeling this is the very first piece of this this kind and the very last piece of this kind and this piece happened to be shown in the city of Coral Springs because uh, I mean this what is this uh, I do uh, art show in the one year period and so if you go down there you might run into it it's somewhere in downtown Coral Springs and speaking of outdoor show, I'm showing these two pieces on the right in the city of Arvada. The show is called Landmark or something. And I brought the two pieces with a bamboo poles and turned into a sculpture form. Again, so if you go down to the city of Arvada, you might run into it. It's in a park very close to old town Arvada. Okay. They are going to be there for three years. So just in case if you remember. And as I said, I make everything by myself from the beginning. And that's a very important concept because almost any sculpture, bronze sculpture you, you have seen in the world, product of commercial foundries. It, all these uh, beautiful artisans taking, take care of the assignment from the artist and, and finish everything because this work is so hard and difficult and just want to stay away, but not me. And I've been doing this for 35 years. This is the image of my a shop in Denver. I wonder if you can see this small a melt furnace, then a small burnout kiln. And I put uh, this white, you know, investment mold into this burnout kiln to burn the inside thing out, such as wax, such as organic materials that burns out with a, a certain temperature. Anyway, so I create cavity in the mold, casting mold, and there I pour this molten bronze into it to realize bronze sculpture. My setup is very small, but I can make large pieces with welding technique. And I use TIG welder to do that. And I wonder if you can notice this tool I'm using for solo casting. This is something I came up earlier and it was simply conceived, but it turned out to be very useful. So I've been making a, a bronze sculpture using this tool again and again and again and again. And I've been fascinated by that, but especially my area on, I was amused uh, and amazed by my invention. And I decided to uh, take some photographic record before I become too used to it and lose interest. I took this two to a shopping mall and started walk on the pavement and someone immediately called police officer. I, I, but I, I ignored him and I went on and took four photos of this in front of the store. So I can go anywhere with two wheels. I can tilt it to any angles. Sometimes I have to go, uh-uh, because -uh, I ran into another two-wheeler guy. Very silly performance artist, Yoshi. Anyway, let me go back. These are the two pieces that I brought from the Abstract Nature series. Very unique uh, pieces. You might have seen them, but pay attention to particularly the piece on the right. I painted one section and mimicking the Aspen, Aspen tree. And so that was uh, my paint job. Then the brown part was my patina job. This series is not very simple. I was connecting this series with my brand new pieces, but I'm changing my mind. I provide those new pieces, a totally different uh, new series. But because this one is, is very important, uh, let me introduce you to this, because you might find a hint why I have been doing what I have been doing. But you have to give me some room a time to explain because it's, it's kind of complex. As Lisa was mentioning at the beginning that I was a glass blower. Indeed, I was. And I came to study glass art in this country first. Then I got, got into this private art school in San Francisco Bay Area as a glass major. But I switched to sculpture in the midway. But I had a certain attachment toward this container thing uh, because I was blowing, you know, a, a, a goblets and dishes and, uh, and salad bowl and things like that. And it was so fun. Even when I moved to sculpture, I needed to deal with the very idea of container in terms of sculptural language. So one day I came up with this large bowl, of, say about two, three feet in diameter in wax, and I turned it into bronze and the casting went well. So I cleaned up the piece. Then I brought the piece back to the foundry to pour another 60 pounds of hot molten metal uh, bronze into the bottom of the piece. And since I don't have a pointer, you know, reddish part was a, a new added bronze. The idea was very simple. I wanted to examine and test, uh, no, not to test, to taste the very containerness of this form. And I think it turned out to be uh, really good and I liked it. And this was made in 1986. 
and it became a, a centerpiece for my MFA show in the following year. One thing I learned, besides I liked it, was the, I mean, the concept was there. So the piece was more like, you know, idea oriented, but the result was very poetic. I was fascinated by that transformation. I'm still thinking about it. And because that's one of the, the uh, sculpture issues that I keep handling and tackling and defining and redefining. I learned something about it from this. Now, after uh, finishing my degree, I stayed at the school another year, getting this visa called apprenticeship visa that granted me to stay another year in the United States. I don't think that visa sti- uh, uh, still exists. It's, it's you know, uh, it's it was, it's a different time and. And, and now the immigration is like, you know, like a fortress to penetrate for applicants. Anyway, what I was doing was a, a shop helper. In exchange, I had this free access to the school family. So I kept making pieces. And because at the time, I had a very simple idea for my life, which was when my visa expires, uh, I just go home. And start my uh, thing in, back home in Japan. And, and knowing that, I wanted to accumulate as many pieces as possible. So I might be able to, having a show to begin with or something. And so I started crank up, you know, really. And also I was dealing with this idea of uh, some kind of utilitarian forms and container forms, things like that. But the, one of the characteristics of the, the pieces in this period is they look like the object came from pre-industrial revolution period. I didn't know why, but there was some, there was some kind of sort of appearance that I adapted for my work. The other characteristics uh, was that there was no cultural origin expressed. For example, I was from Japan, so I could use the, all these beautiful antique tools from you know ancient period. Well, I was intentionally avoiding these things uh, and trying to make it enigmatic as possible. And that's why I call it enigmatic artifact series. And this, so you, might, you may say, okay, these are uh, something look like uh, came from Middle Age Europe or from the, the middle of Africa uh, or something like that. And, but you, I don't think you can tell. And I couldn't tell. And first of all, I didn't know why I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing, and it was totally mysterious to me because I was fascinated by what I was making, and despite the fact that I was a maker, but I had no interest articulating during this time because I was simply going home, you know. I was not promoting my art in the Bay Area, uh, no interest teaching. Forget it. I had zero interest teaching art in any college. Although I had a qualification for it, but the, I was just keep making, 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 making. Yeah, this question that even I asked by who? Uh, yeah, I made it, but by who and for whom? Uh, I was so productive. The, probably one of the most productive period I have ever had in my life. See, I was still in my twenties. I had I had incredible physical, you know, energy and vitality, and also motivation. So I just cranking up, but because the way I was working, uh, like locomotive, and people started to notice uh, the product, my product, particularly my pro- ex-professor was quite intrigued into you. He started to promote my art in the Bay Area without asking my consent, but in the back. Uh, so it, when I found, I was in a group show here and there, and the following year, 1988, I had my very first solo exhibition at the commercial gallery in San Francisco. And I was amazed and amused. The Gary was, was uh, the Gary that my professor was showing. So he obviously made a connection for me. And I didn't ask, you know, <laughs> I tell you, I didn't do anything. But in, I think, you know, the fate ha- happens sometimes unexpectedly, right? No, 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 no. A fate happens always unexpectedly. And that was my case. But I didn't know what I was doing. But looking back now, I could tell clearly why I was making those pieces back then. I was insecure. And so I was hiding uh, behind this strange object. The reason I became insecure has nothing to do with, uh, say, financial situations or visa situations, whatever. I was insecure about much larger issues. This world is, is being swallowed by this new technology, you know, this tsunami waves of new technology coming at us. Uh, remember, I was in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and the Silicon Valley was at our doorsteps. No, it was inside of a house. It's so hazy, so I couldn't identify what, but I could smell. It was still in an analog period. Hope you could understand 
uh, uh, those young ones. No one had any computer, you know, personal computers and cell phone and uh, smartphone, forget it, because there weren't any internet back then. It took another five years or something to, to get this that in- infrastructure uh, uh, started to be activated. Of course, there, was, there were computers, I'm sorry, from IBM. You know, IBM machine and military uh, uh, scientists and maybe high-end large corporations probably they are using there uh, to calculate data. But those days they are using this computer code, uh, which is the kind of a sequence of, kind of strange symbols. And I had no idea what was what was about it. But they need to understand that in order to, to make a command to this machine. And it was Apple that finally started to introduce a language font and Steve Jobs. Hallelujah. So we can command computer with language, but back then it was computer language, you know that? So that was the kind of situation, but since I was in the Bay Area, I had all these rumors about upcoming something in more like a fantasy talk, more like a hypothetical stories from the media. For instance, if we have this system, we can do this, this kind of incredible thing, and it became very useful, for example, medical industry is something like that if you have this gadget you can do this do that and all these kind of kind of fancy talk and i was very excited as a young artist and in in my 20s and uh, i was gathering all these informations and naturally because I, I like to be irrelevant in a contemporary society so i was gathering all these information at the same time i noticed i started to become afraid of it and it because so mysterious and unknown but people are excited about it. I thought this way. Man, you know, I was studying and trying to master the very analog art of sculpture and with my hands and body and sweating all the time, drinking beer all the time. But something is coming, digital mysterious something. And it's approaching like a, the fog in San Francisco in the summer. I had to imagine, well, maybe it, it's going to change the world. It's going to turn the world upside down. And people is going to be very busy with this new technology stuff and fascinated by it. losing time to end up with losing time to appreciate the, the analog art that I was doing. So, man, I probably my work is going to be irrelevant in the future. People is going to pay less attention to it. Hey, how unlucky. But, of course, I, I'm, I'm kind of, sort of against the grain type uh, since I was a kid. And, okay, if you say so, uh, let me try this, uh, take this bronze casting very seriously. The technology that the human civilization is uh, discovered and started exercised 5,500 years ago. And at the time, it was the highest technology. Okay, let me do this and see what happened. Because I noticed uh, probably uh, not no many are going to uh, start uh, to pay attention to this side of uh, real. Uh, so that my commitment to the, the, to the material bronze had something to do with the you know, environment I was in. And that's also fate. But there was a true story. And there was one interesting irony happened during that time. And this piece was made in 1988. And I had a second show in, in San Francisco because first gallery disappeared. By the way, that first gallery was incredible. And one of the top three galleries in, in town. And when I joined the owner uh, said, hey, Yoshi, we're going to get you an uh, immigration visa for working permission. And we have a good lawyer with us. Uh, don't worry, we pay for it. So they did that without me asking them to, to do that. So there was another gift, but it's, it's, it's quite interesting to to recall because that means a dealer was not just the people that are showing artists work and selling, and but they, they were more like a, a patron to the young upcoming artists. So they help in the basic life issues, you know, throwing show. So it, really interesting, you know, it was still in the Cold War period and still in the analog period. You know, the world changed a lot. Well, anyway, I had a second show in, in, the, in the second gallery, and they also lasted only maybe three, four years. But wonderful people with a great taste and a vision, but probably they didn't have enough business, you know, a skill to survive. But anyway, they called me up during the show, telling me that they saw this piece. And so I went, great, income. <laughs> 
Then they added by saying, Yoshi, we sold that piece to a president, a CEO of Hewlett Packard. And so I went, great, income, because I didn't know anything about the company. And I was that ignorant in, in those days. And it took me probably three, four years to figure out the, the name of the company and uh, connecting with the, what they are doing. But I lost touch with these, uh, you know, Gary people. And so I didn't have a chance to ask uh, this person who bought this piece. And very curious because, you know, what they are doing is opposite of, of what I was doing. This piece do nothing. It just stay there. And it doesn't give you anything in my uh, mentally, but it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't move. And it's such a stupid, dumb uh, piece of sculpture. But I didn't have a chance to ask him. Anyway, originally, I was connecting this brand new piece uh, with the Enigmatic Artifact series. But um, I'm changing my mind. And it's a brand new series because there weren't any uh, twisted psychology behind. So it's more about the celebration of culture and nature. And I tell you why. Uh, one day I was sat in my backyard slowly with a breeze in the air and came down to where I was sat. And I thought, wow, I had never seen this uh, thing before. Let me call it UFO. But I was fascinated by this form because so elegant. You know, this flat plane and carved edge and strong line coming out from the middle. And so I immediately thought, ah, this can be an inspiration for my future sculpture. And so I stand in the middle of the piece in the imagination, hold this joystick and started fly as if it's a futuristic flying machine or something. And so it was very memorable. And, and that turned me on to take a look at other flying seas from trees. And they were around and not difficult to find. Uh, for instance, the one on the right, it's a pine seeds. I love pine cones. And there's a seed and a wing is attached to it. And you find it in each slot of pine cone. And these are the pine nuts. And I love them in my cooking because I love to cook a pasta dish with the pine, pine nuts. Other thing was uh, maple seeds. And I have maple in my backyard. And so uh, the same thing with uh, the pine, uh, pine seed. It split in the middle and it started to fly, uh, cutting air and turn like a helicopter. So I was fascinated by these uh, design again uh, because I was not paying too much attention uh, to it before. But when I look, look at them, I noticed they look like uh, insect wings. And, and because of the strong arm and a thing uh, lines supporting this flat, uh, semi-transparent uh, wing section. And this design, it almost, like, almost like exactly like insect mimic. So I, I, I thought, okay, insect mimicked the plant life. And that, that was my theory. Uh, because, you know, the plant came to the surface of our fast, then insect follow. And so I double-checked many things. And also I br that brought my interest uh, to the insect wings. And I left the, uh, uh, the plant seeds behind. And I checked the timeline and the first insect uh, ancestral type appeared 400 million years ago. And the very first winged insect was discovered through the uh, evidence that is the fossilized evidence, so that's concrete evidence. And, and that was uh, 325 million years ago. So there was 75 million years of uh, space in between the first insect and this. So I, I'm really certain that the insect uh, was observing the, in, in the way a plant sees flying and moving, and they want it, they want it that way. They want to fly. So they develop their own wings based on that observation and in determination. And these insect wings are a very unique invention because you, the bird wings are usually uh, it's extension of hands. Like bat, you remember seeing the teeny hands uh, at the end? And so it arms are spread out. Uh, same thing with the bird. But the insect developed the wings on the back. And it's totally in inventive from the physiological point of view. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sad. By the way, this fossil from 300, 17 million years ago, huge. Don't you think 70 a centimeter? And I got this, uh, this lady is a scientist, but having this model to show how enormous this creature is. And that's, that's surprising. But also it surprised me to, to find a very similarity with our contemporary dragonfly. 
in terms of design. So I started to admire dragonfly as one of the longest surviving insects with a lot, you know, ancient design. I hope you do that too. <laughs> Anyway, I'm an artist, so of course I look at other people's art and, you know, their effort. I found this uh, Western art on Tante last year while I was making this dragon wing bronze piece. And you can argue me if, you, if I were wrong, but I discovered that if you combine the human figure with uh, bird wings, you create an angel. But when you combine with figure with insect wings, a fairy. No? Okay, no argument? Okay. But that kind of thing made me decide to call this piece uh, Wings of Fairy. I came to the first day of the show and observed what people are doing in the gallery, and I found immediately very peculiar behaviors in, in, in the gallery space. Everyone was using my dragonfly wing piece as a photo opportunity, and standing in the middle, I could tell the implication of it, right? I thought, wow, my work became interactive art <laughs> during the show. That means I may, I'm creating a lot of fairies in Colorado through this show. Okay, I spoke too much and I'm finishing up, okay? And very soon, I'd like to sit under the canopy of locust tree in my backyard. And I sit and then think and think and think till I get tired of thinking too much. And I really do. So I look up above my head and notice the, all these uh, baby fun like locust tree leaves overlapping each other to create dense uh, spots and thin spots all over. The whole thing reminds me of, of a panel of green stained glass that is mingling with the incoming light. And it's quite uh, delightful because I feel like I'm encased in an exquisite piece of art. But of course, I know it was not made by artists, any artist, uh, but by nature. However, my interpretation of it is coming from my uh, culture soil. So I noticed that I gather all these information, including the impression from daily life, such as the one I just uh, described. And I look at art and I seek inspiration, I think, in the books and internet. And I gather all these and throw them into my conceptual tank to distill. And in order to reduce them into some necessary visual essences. And so that's where my art is usually coming from. So I call it, uh, I'm practicing eidetic reduction for the creation of art. You know, life is short, obvious. And I see that way too. You know, I came to Colorado uh, while I was still in my 40s. <laughs> and now 63, what happened? Where did my time go? But it's a natural thing. But, so I hope, at least, my art is going to be a long-lasting one. Uh, just like my obsidian aloe head and ceramic Hanua sculpture head that I have at home. And I believe the material bronze is not going to disagree with my wish because it is designated uh, that way. And therefore, I whisper to bronze, so be it. Thank you.